Beckon me to come and call us to your deep. Beckon. Abba Father, we say a big thank you for this honor again to learn of you, to consider your wisdom, your ways, your words, and to be built into a habitation for you. We plead that your spirit will guide us into all truth. We plead that you will breathe upon your word that it comes with life and with power. We plead that you will raise faith in the heart of listeners. That the words we receive will be mixed with faith to profit us and many generations. And we ask that you will bring deliverance by virtue of the power in your living world. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Abba Father. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, welcome once again to Discovering True Riches. It's nice having you. And we'll be going further from where we stopped the last time. Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7, verse 3 to 5. We'll be looking at verse 3 to 5 for today as God wills. And I read. And when thou beholdest, and why beholdest thou the moat? that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye. Or how will thou say to thy brother, let me pull out the moat out of thine eye, and behold, a beam is in thine own eye, thou hypocrite. First cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then, Thou shalt see clearly to cast out the moat out of thy brother's eye. From the previous teaching, we began to see the matters of judgment and we saw that Jesus was drawing our attention away from judging others and beginning to judge ourselves. And we got to see that if we should judge ourselves, we should not be judged. And that the psalmist says, For I have acknowledged my sins, and my sins are ever before me. And because he has sent ahead his error to tell God, This is my wrong, forgive me. He began to tell us the benefits of the things that come afterward. That if we spend more time using the Bible as a mirror to see into our own lives, it will be better than using the Bible as a magnifying glass to look into other people's lives more and more and all the time that we consider our own lives more when we look into the word of the Lord than the life of others. It is in such a continuous in verse 3 where we said, he said, and so you know he's continuing from do not judge others. Um, why should you judge another person? With the measure you judge someone else is the measure with which you will be judged. He continues further to begin to tell us that why are you beholding the moat that is in your brother's eye when there is a beam in your own eye? To, to behold is to give a critical attention, a spiritual attention to a matter. You are trying to look at somebody's like, why is he gossiping? Why is he fornicating? Why is he lying? Why is he teaching? And God is saying, why are you spending so much time on another person's error when so much time should be spent checking my own? Seeing how to fix my own. And he gives us reasons to that. We'll be going through scriptures to see light in this matter by the grace of God. Of what God intends from us. There's this saying in English language that says that actions speak louder than words. That means that if I'm going to tell someone to be right, I will be able to communicate better if I'm becoming right. That means that if I get right and I tell someone to be right, it's going to be good because he said, if you remove the, the beam in your own eye, you will see clearly to help the other person. So there's a need to help other people. But in the verge of helping other people, we should give more attention to ourselves. 
you hear Apostle Paul speak to, I think it was Timothy, he said, take heed to yourself and to the doctrine. And he said, in so doing, you will save them that hear you. So if there is a people that give attention to me, the Bible is saying, I should learn to take heed to myself. I should think of my own life. What is wrong with my own life? And try to fix it more. The more I fix my life, the stronger my words will become because my actions are going to speak louder than my words. So if my actions are right, I may just whisper the right words and it has effect. If my actions are wrong, I can shout the right words and it doesn't have an effect. So Jesus began to draw us to that matter that there can be a log in my eye. I shouldn't spend more time looking at the moat in another person's eye. Uh, that word moat and beam, I want us to get an idea of it. The beam is the same word we use for beam. Though nowadays when you have a beam in a structure, it's made of concrete and iron rods. But in the Old Testament or in the olden days, beams were made with logs of wood. That's a big piece of wood. And it's done because it's supposed to sustain a higher floor, an upper room. Or it's supposed to sustain a roof. That means if you talk about a beam, there is something the beam is sustaining. There is something it is holding so that thing will not fall, it will not crash. And when he spoke about the moat, he was speaking about a little stubble or chaff. Now you know that um, a beam, one beam can give you maybe a million chaff, a billion chaff, a million pieces of... That means that there is something in a man's life that is upholding disaster or something not to crash. And that thing is in place. But instead of dealing with that thing, he's busy trying to deal with the tiny chaff and the tiny speck or stubble that is in that man's eye. So have the picture of a moat that's small, tiny, and have a picture of a beam that's a mighty log of wood that sustains something else. It is kept because it is going to hold a load upon itself. If we invest more time trying to be more like Jesus, it will be easy for us to win people. The more I become like Jesus, the easier it will be for whatever I do to attain to people. Um, shockingly, you even see this among unbelievers. A matter happens and then the person says, I know that what I did is wrong. But if it is bro, A, that is coming to talk on the matter, I will not listen to him. But if it is bro, B, I will listen. Why? You say bro, A? Bro, A is also this. He is this. He is that. So why who gives him the right to speak? It means that bro, A needs to work more to become like Jesus if he will be able to remove whatever that chaff or stubble is in that person's life. Many times people are waiting until we become better to be able to trust us to remove the one in their own eye. That means if I'm going to judge a matter and discern a matter and get solution to a matter, I will have to grow to become an authority over that matter. That means that matter doesn't hold me to ransom. Whether it's lust, it is anger, it's unforgiveness, it's malice. The more I grow over it, the better I have authority to deliver another person that is a victim to it. Therefore, as a minister and as a believer, I should spend more time checking inward to become more like Jesus. The reason Jesus is going further to tell us this, he says, and where thou, why beholdest thou the moat in, that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam in thine eye, is because if I leave the beam in my eye, there are a lot of things that that beam is going to keep. Permit me to use the word. It can keep a whole floor of rubbish, of waste, of error in a man's life. Now, with a little idea that I have in building, many times a beam is hidden. For example, if they make a beam that should hold a decking in a building, many times they will seal it up, plaster it, paint it. You won't see it. You just come and see a flat roof. But you don't know that there are beams passing through it that hold it in place. 
many times what is a beam in a man's life is not something visible. It's not something tangible as it were that you can say, see, I saw him lying, cheating, fornicating. Many times we call it in the body of Christ a spiritual sin or they call them sins of the spirit. These are sins that they can be in your eye and they don't allow you to see accurately what is in the other person's eye or they give you a wrong judgment of things. I want us to see three examples and then possibly we'll pray about it and see what it makes us become. The first person I want us to see is the life of Cain, Genesis chapter 4 from verse 1. Genesis chapter 4 from verse 1. I would love to read that and then we'll look at one of the beams that can be in a man's life that makes it hard for the man to judge another matter accurately or to help another person in a matter. Genesis chapter 4 from verse 1. I'll read verse 1 to 8. It's, it's a bit lengthy but it's a Bible study. And Adam knew Eve his wife and she conceived and bare Cain and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. And she again bare his brother Abel. And Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering to the Lord. Who started the offering? Cain. And Abel also. So we know Abel is secondary in the matter brought of the firstling of his flock and of the fat thereof, and the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. But unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect, and Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. And said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth, and why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. And unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. Verse 8. And Cain talked with Abel, his brother. And it came to pass when they were in the field, that Cain rose up against his brother and slew him. Pause. They finish a sacrifice, both of them. And then Cain didn't do well as God wanted. If you go to the book of Hebrews, you'll find that by faith, Abel offered a more excellent sacrifice. That means that the factor that made Cain's sacrifice not to operate accurately was that faith was lacking in it. And without faith, it is impossible to please God. So Cain has decided to give an offering and then God see that they are not anger in you. Cain, if you had done better, I would have accepted it. This anger that is in you is about to stir up something. A sin called murder. God didn't tell him murder, but we found out later. Is knocking at the door. And what is going to open the door for that mother is called hatred, anger, wrath. It's going to build up something in you, Cain, that when you consider issues, you won't consider them right again. Now, what is knocking the door of Cain is murder. The desire to kill his brother. But the beam that is holding up a desire to kill is anger. Wrath. That wrath has built up. Do you notice that in verse 8, the Bible says, And Cain talked with Abel his brother. That's what I want us to discuss first. Do you think he went to Abel and said, Abel, come here, I'm going to deal with you today. Follow me to the bush. No. He came to him, Cain, can we stroll down to the bush? He looked like he loved his brother. Everything looked okay, just like a beam hides and you don't see it. 
Anger had hidden somewhere. He was living normal like nothing was happening. I don't know how many days it took between the sacrifice and this day. But throughout all those days, people didn't see that there was a sin in the spirit of Cain. And what kept it successfully there was just rough, anger, hatred. He was just angry. And shockingly, a man can be angry and sit down and be smiling with you and people will be laughing. But you see, that anger is what Jesus is referring to in the book of Matthew chapter 7 as a beam. You don't see it. He's smiling, he's laughing, he's happy, he's gisting with Abel. Maybe they even finish eating together and they say, Abel, let's stroll down. Let me show you something around that farm area where I'm farming. Come, let's go that way. And Abel stood up free without securing himself. Why? Because he can't see the beam. And for Cain, because that beam has sustained the wrong perspective, Cain, that if I kill Abel, God doesn't have an option, he will like my offering. Who told you? Remember in the last teaching we did, judgment in the accurate perspective was designed to uphold a man and to help him stand. But judgment in the perspective of a carnal and a natural man is designed to bring down a man. You judge him because he, look at you, you are a liar, you are a liar. You just want to prove he's a liar. But in God, when judgment comes and says you are a liar, it's to the intent to deliver you from lie. So you are saying now that Cain is applying, he's discerning the matter between him and Abel. He's trying to judge that matter. But in his judgment, he's trying to see how Cain, Abel will fall. But what is making him do that is a beam. A beam called anger. Wrath. Do you know what wrath is? Wrath is like a, an elder brother to anger. When you are angry, have you seen people that are angry and they are vibrating? That's called wrath. It's a sin in the spirit. Your spirit man is so... And meanwhile, any time you see a sin in the spirit, just remember what I'm telling you. It's called a beam. It's not about the anger. There is something the anger is keeping. For him, it was keeping something called murder. The reason why murder cannot be removed from the life of Cain is that anger has created a sustaining platform for it. So Cain can live normal for five years with Abel. And you don't know that for five years, he's only strategizing strategizing how to kill Abel. Why? He has gotten a beam that can sustain it. Jesus is not saying remove the beam. And I assure you, when you remove the beam, a lot of things are going to crumble down. I wish the church will be sincere enough to allow people to remove their beam. Do you know if somebody comes to you and tells you, the beam in my life is anger. And truly, in that anger, I've been planning how to kill so so person. Will you help the person to remove the beam, sweep out the refuse, and help the person stand? Or you are the one that will go out and say, Ah, it's just a beam that is keeping it. We know what is there. Are you seeing the difference between the perspective of God and man when it comes to judgment? Let's have another example. So, but for Cain, he left that beam. The beam blinded him till he killed his brother. It had removed the capacity of being a brother's keeper. He became a brother's destroyer. Let's see somebody else in the Bible. Esau, Genesis chapter 27. I said we'll look at three examples before we'll now bring it down to ourselves and pray. Genesis 27 and verse 41. Genesis 27 and verse 41. Esau. Twenty-seven verse forty-one. The story is a long one, so I'll just read this verse 
and then we explain with the story. It says, And Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing wherewith his father blessed him. And Esau said in his heart, The days of mourning for my father are at hand. Then will I slay my brother Jacob. Now, when you read the story of Esau, you hear that Esau hated Jacob. But do you know where it really started? Unforgiveness. The beam in the life of Esau was that Esau found it hard to forgive Jacob. I hope you know it took over 21 years before their father even died because Jacob ran away, came back before their father died. Thank God that God delivered Esau. That means Esau will have sustained the beam of unforgiveness. Sister, you wonder why relationships don't work for you. Meanwhile, the beam call on forgiveness that you have concerning the first guy you felt that broke your heart or the other guy that broke your heart is still there. And what it keeps doing is that the beam is helping you to pile up issues. Unforgiveness. In my opinion, my opinion, the greatest things that destroy, I believe, are things of the spirit. Things that you can't touch, you can't see, you can't handle. They can hide, even the owner of that sin, the sin can be hidden for the, from the person for long. He's not even aware that he's still there. God told that he has not forgiven the person. He said that when he met the person three years down the line, he, a bitterness arose from within. That's when you now remember that you have not forgiven. We are going somewhere. We will carry beams. And we want to be able to look at a matter and look at it righteously. When you, you didn't forgive this person, it was my lecturer in school that didn't make me pass. It was my friend that didn't let me get promotion. It was my colleague that did not let me get the job. Or my friend didn't let me get the job. My colleague didn't let me get promotion. And you hold them. Beans. I was opportune to visit a friend somewhere. And he had he told me a story about someone. Someone he was working on. The person was a lunar. Depressed. Emaciated. I saw the person. The person was looking like he wanted to die or something. If you, if you see him, you know this man is losing everything. He was living alone. What happened? They did something wrong to him in the office and he vowed that he must destroy those people in the office. Do you know he was still going to work, smiling with them? But I don't know if they were aware that even his family and everything were no more around him. He had one agenda. He was no more going to work because he wanted the things in the office to work. If you see him working in the office, it's not the work he's interested in. If you see him trying to keep his job, it's not because he wants the job to work. He was keeping his job as an access that he wants to destroy all these people. Even his own life was getting lost. Do you know what happened to Esau? That being called on forgiveness was what stirred hatred that he wanted to kill his brother. The Bible calls Esau in the New Testament, Esau the fornicator. Esau became a fornicator because he wouldn't forgive Jacob. Uh, Jacob. E Esau ended up in polygamy. He married strange women. I'm not married one, married more. Just because he won't forgive Jacob. Hello? Esau decided to dedicate his life hurt his parents. The Bible said when he married one of the women there and found out that it did not please Rebecca and Isaac and that it grieved their heart, he married them more. He saw entered full-fledged rebellion. One, just one beam was holding everything. Unforgiveness. 
One being. Well, let me show, let me share my story. While I was in the junior secondary school, just one to just two, I was doing awesome in mathematics. Awesome. I loved it. Until I had a teacher who for which reason I do not know kind of hated my cousin sister. I, I'm later thinking maybe he asked out and she refused or something. I don't know. But I didn't know then. When he comes to the class, he'll just move to her seat and knock her head or just flog her for no reason before he starts teaching. He grieved me. I was hurt. How can you be treating my cousin sister like this? And that pain in my heart was so much I hated the teacher. And because I hated it, I him, I could not get what he was teaching. That's how I said failing mathematics. I wrote Waek not once, just because of the same mathematics. That thing followed me for years till I wrote Waek because I couldn't forgive the man. He didn't do anything to me. He was doing to somebody else, but I couldn't forgive him for doing something to somebody else. And it was destroying my academics. What has my academics got to do with unforgiveness? The unforgiveness had a beam. A beam, that beam called unforgiveness, it had a rubbish called failure. So failure accompanied my mathematics because I couldn't forgive a teacher. You can carry on forgiveness and you will be, you yourself, you will become something strange just because a beam. When you look at a building, it's not many beams that hold. You can have four beams, just four. Or even one beam. And that beam holds the whole structure on top. And what is on top is disaster. So Esau became a fornicator. Esau became rebellious. Esau became a murderer at heart. Esau became dishonorable to his parents because he knew what they wanted him to do and decided I will not do it. Esau began to plan how to destroy people's lives. I used to feel for the lady he married. She would think Esau loved her. No. Esau only married her to use her as a tool to hurt his parents. <sighs> let me say this to help someone listening. Hear me. Don't let people use you for their own forgiveness. Somebody is angry with John. Then he's using you as a tool to fight John. And you don't know. You think the person loves you. He's giving you advice on what to do to fight John. He's not giving you advice because he loves you. Esau went to ask out that lady, not because he loved her. He asked her out because he wanted to hurt his parents. He paid her dowry, not because he wanted the wife. He paid her dowry to hurt his parents. He brought her to the house, gave her room. Made her give back to children, not because he cared about her. Some people are using you, not because they care about you, because they have a beam. They, they want to fight others. Do you remember how the Pharisees used Judas? We are coming here. That's the next point. You See, you can get a good counsel from a man that has a bad heart for somebody else. The person hates Philip. Then he gives you a good counsel. The counsel is good. But the reason he's giving you the counsel is not because he wants you to become good. Meanwhile, the counsel is supposed to make you good. Oh, let me give you an example. The guy goes to ask a lady out. And the lady said no. And the lady said, I don't want you. Then his friend now comes to him and tells him, So, so lady, you, I like her. I want to ask her out. But because he's angry with that lady for saying no. Really, the person talking to him does not need to go out with that lady. It's, even, it's not God's will. So that means if I tell him don't go out with the lady, it's not God's will for him to go out with the lady. But you now tell him don't go out with the lady because in your heart the reason is there's a beam. So that she will, I will deal with her. Say she will not accept me. No guy will come and will spoil her market. Ah. Let me tell you something. If Mr. A that was thinking of going out with her now accepts this counsel, which should have been God's will for him, he will not only refuse to go out with her, which God wanted, but he will start hating her because the, the, the counsel will be such that we stir hatred in him because the spirit by which the counsel came to him was because this person hated this person, so he gave you counsel, now you hate this person. But if you had gone to meet a pastor or somebody that is neutral and say, I want to ask this lady, and the person prays, ah, 
It's not God's will. Don't ask her out. He will still not ask her out, but he will not hate her. Because nothing has been transmitted of evil. If you had met Esau to ever give you advice about Jacob, Esau will make Jacob your enemy. Even if his advice is good, say, and if you are working with Jacob, oh, be careful about him. Jacob cheats people and takes their blessing. It's true. But if Esau is the one that gave you that advice, after Esau finished, you will hate Jacob. But if you found an accurate man that gives you the same advice, you will walk with Jacob and be wise and Jacob won't cheat you, yet you will not hate him. Because the beam, that spiritual sin is transmittable. Hear me, God taught me something some years back and he used the word. What was this thing? There was this disease that was going around the air that time. Is this SARS? No, it's not SARS. COVID. He says spirits are more contagious than COVID. The most contagious thing you can ever have is a spirit. So a man with a spiritual sin is more disastrous than a man with a physical sin. The man with hatred can transmit hatred faster than the man with fornication can transmit fornication. The man with envy can transmit envy faster. Oh, okay. Let's see the third one. Matthew chapter 27. The matters of discernment. The matters of judgment. Matthew chapter 27. Help me turn quickly. Matthew 27. Let's get there. Matthew chapter 20 verse 17. I want us to read something. Okay, let me start from 15 to 18. He was now at the feast, the governor was warned to release unto the people a prisoner whom they would, and they they had then. Pilate said unto them, Least unto you, but for envy they had delivered him. Pause. Oh, it was not for heresy that they accused him for. It was not for doing a miracle on the Sabbath day. All those things you saw the Pharisees did around Jesus, there was a beam under in their eye called envy. Each time they looked at Jesus, they were looking through the eye of envy. Why are you doing a miracle on the Sabbath day? They were not saying, why are you doing a miracle on the Sabbath day? Because they wanted to keep the law of Moses. No! They were not doing it to obey God. They were doing it because of envy. Do you know they used to attend Jesus' program? Pharisees. A lot. They attend his programs. The Bible says because of envy that they may have a word to trap him. It's not everyone that comes around that is coming for good. No. Someone will listen to you preach for one hour. The only thing he's looking for is the mistake you made. That sentence you made that the person feels is not correct. He will go back home and for God that you preach for 50. Those remaining five minutes, you didn't understand enough and you didn't do it well. It is only that five minutes. That's how the world is. He did altar call. They will not put it on newspaper. People were healed. They won't put it on newspaper. Then during the thing, he just mistakenly said, Nigeria is a disaster. Then they will quote it. Pastor so so and so said Nigeria is a disaster. Why not try Pastor so so? Prayed. People gave their life to Jesus. Ten people were healed. It was a peaceful meeting. Why did you forget the 55 minutes of the accurate things? 
I see something that makes me wonder. You've known a man for five years. And for five years, he has been a blessing. It's a mistake for five minutes. And that's the only thing you remember about the person. You've known your mother all your life. She fed you, paid your school fees. Then one day she got angry and slapped you and said you are a failure. And that is all you remember about your mother. Nothing is wrong with your mother. Something is wrong with you. And that's the beam. You've been my friend. Yes. And then last week I told you to borrow me money. I saw money in your hand and you told me you have money but you can't borrow me. Then I said you are my enemy. Meanwhile for two years you have been taking care of me and loving me. Something is not wrong with you. Something is wrong with me. That's the beam. It's a hidden thing called envy. You will see Pharisees preparing themselves. Let's go. Jesus is preaching. Let's go. When you see them coming early, you think they are coming early to learn. They are coming early because of something called envy. Let me tell you what became the issue. One, that envy began to build something in there called covetousness. Study the book of Matthew. Mark, Luke, and John. You will see these things I'm saying. There are many scriptures you will see that they were envious that the crowd was going after him and not them. The problem is not the crowd. The problem is, I'm not the one. That's called envy. Why is it that it's him they are listening to? So envy now makes you start looking for. You heal people. They don't want to see the people you healed. They want to see the Sabbath day you healed him. You enter the house and in that house, you did healings for people. You don't want to see the healing. The house is the house of a sinner. He's not eating with a sinner. You sit down with your disciples after you have done 40 days and 40 nights without their knowledge. You sit down, you are eating and relaxing. Say he's a gluten. He's a gluten. And he's a wine Bible. Do you know the Pharisees don't believe in resurrection it was the Sadducees that did yes the Pharisees don't believe in resurrection but the Pharisees came and asked Jesus Jesus there was a woman her husband died she married 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 in the day of resurrection who will be her husband the people asking the question don't believe in resurrection see envy can push you out and strange things begin to happen the Pharisees became covetous. The Pharisees began bribery. So they called a Judas Iscariot and bribed him to use him to perpetuate their envy. That was the problem of Judas Iscariot. And listen to me out there. Stop letting people use you for the sins of their spirit. That's what the world is doing to the church also. They come and say, your pastor is, your this person is. You have been listening to your pastor preach for 10 years. 10, 10 years. Then somebody came in three minutes and told you, your pastor is a thief. Then you believe the person and you left your pastor. It's a sign that you had never believed your pastor before. Simple. Can you imagine somebody coming to tell me, Jude, your spiritual father, blah, 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 blah. I say, eh, say, say thank you. Eh, well done. You have no idea of how I got here. Do you know how, more, how long I've listened to him that it's now you I should listen to overnight? If you are angry with him, carry your anger on your head and face him with it. That's your problem. But you took their envy, put it in Judas Iscariot. So they entered bribery. Third, the, this is the most shocking part for me. Jesus had done miracles and healed people. And then Pilate now brought Barabbas. The reason he chose Barabbas was Barabbas was so bad that nobody wants Barabbas in the society. So he knew that. I knew it's because of envy. If they see Barabbas, they will tell me to release Jesus. Right there, I don't know how many minutes it took. 
the Pharisees transferred their envy into the crowd. I think I was watching one Jesus movie and they went to the crowd, say, choose Barabbas, choose Barabbas, choose Barabbas. Tell them to crucify Jesus. In, in a short while, they transmitted their envy and the whole crowd began to shout, crucify Jesus, free Barabbas. And I was wondering, how can you allow these guys to use you as a tool? I'll tell you why. The sins of the spirit are extremely contagious. It's easy to make somebody hate somebody you hate. It's easy. It's easy to make you despise people. Someone sent me a link or something somebody said about my father in the Lord. I knew it was something bad. I already knew. Because he himself had even prayed and told us that see what they are planning to do about him. When he sent me the link, he said, how can this person write this? They read about my father in the Lord, I think about um, and one other man of God. And when he sent me the link, he said, see what they wrote. How can they write this thing? When I saw the link, I told the person, I said, well, I don't even open those links. That's me. There is no need opening it. Let me tell you what happens. The moment you open it and read it, except Jesus helps you, you will start despising, you will start suspecting. You, the next time you, you start doing like this, is it, is, could it be that? Could it be? And what will happen is that you will lose your place. If, G, if the Jesus that sent me to my father in the Lord, if there's anything he wants me to know about him, he should come and tell me. It was not the news that sent me to him. How can the news not tell me about him? It was not you that led me to him as my spiritual father. Why will you now be the one to determine how I see him? God led you to a friend. Another friend. Another friend. Nan came and told you something. And God didn't tell you that thing. And you think that thing is important. That means you received your judgment from a canal place. So I told the person, I don't, don't send me this link. I don't even want to know. And I told the person, do you know what happens here? When you open that link, the person that posted it will see 2,000 views. It will be happy. The thing is going around. Stop sharing it. Listen to me, Christians. Stop sharing on Facebook those things. Stop it. If you stop sharing it, it will die. Pastor, call. stop it. If you join it, let me tell you what you have become. The Bible calls Satan the accuser of the brethren. He didn't say that what the Satan was accusing the brethren was true or not, but he's an accuser. Whether the thing he's saying is true or is not true. The accuser is one that brings forth the accusations against somebody. If Satan is accused, why should I? Each time you keep sharing that thing, what you are doing is that you are helping in propagating accusations. Judas was destroyed out of his place. And let me show you. Anyone that transmits anger to you. Is you that has not planned. Can I tell you why? The Pharisees never laid their hand on Jesus. Go and check the stories. They never did. But they were the ones with the envy. They used Judas to betray him. They told Pilate to declare his crucifixion. They gathered the people and told the people to shout crucify him. When he was hanging on the cross, they now came and stood on the cross. If you are the son of God, come down, we will believe you. Time to seal his grave, they went and met. They kept using people, they themselves did it. When his garments were on the ground, they didn't go to tear it to cast law. Those guys knew their plans. That's why the people that push envy in you, when you have been destroyed, they will be standing by the corner. You will find out that they didn't do any. You can't find their hands on it. You know why? The sins of the spirit does not want to leave his print. Why? You need to discern beyond words. I don't know. I think God is trying to help many people with this teaching. Don't, don't let... Your choir director's anger about a member get to you. Then you start getting angry with that member. Don't let it.
Pastor Papa is envy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is it not just Pasha that they promoted him? You think I like him? I'm just watching him now. Somebody that just came to this office, be there. We are watching. I'm just telling you, this guy is a bad guy. He's doing corner, corner, corner. That's why they have promoted him. Then in the office, the next day you saw that guy entering the office. He said, Good morning. And as usual, he said, Ah, good morning. How are you doing? How's the family? The next day, when he said, Good morning, he said, Ah, good morning. One week later, he said, Good morning. Just raise your hand. Three weeks later, you have joined in the clique of those planning for his downfall. He didn't do anything to you. Somebody else is in the envy. You have become a tool. Can you decide and say no? I won't let people transmit certain things to me that are not my own. I won't let it. I won't let it. If you are angry with somebody, don't take, I'm not a contractor, don't call. Hold your anger. I, I have a lot I'm trying to remove. I don't want another envy, another jealousy, another unforgiveness, another anger, another wrath, another malice. These are the things of the spirit. You don't see them. They are just there. And when they want to show up, they show up in a different way. Anger showing up as murder, unforgiveness showing up as fornication. How can unforgiveness show up as fornication for heaven's sake? And Esau was a fornicator. The sins of the spirit will make you great. Who is a hypocrite? A one that is a stage player. He's only playing on a stage. That's not his risk. Have you seen somebody acting drama on a stage? He's acting as Satan. He's not Satan. He's acting as Jesus. He's not Jesus. A, a small girl is acting as a mother. And then her age mate is her daughter in the drama. And she says, my daughter. What the sins of the spirit does is that it makes you an actor. You begin to have a replication of life that is not real from the inside. And that is one of the worst things. Listen. Have you heard when Jesus said, bless and curse not? Let me show you something in the Bible. Matthew chapter 23. I title my two twenty three also judgments. That's my my title of it. When Jesus was talking about, he was talking about the scribes and the Pharisees. When the Bible says "woe unto you," is it a blessing or a curse? It's a curse. That was where Jesus cursed. I mean, Jesus met a woman that has had five houses, but he didn't curse her. He preached for her; she got born again. He met the madman of Gadara with. A legion of demons. He didn't curse him. He delivered him. He made the woman caught in the very act. He didn't curse her. He condemned you. But at Pharisees. He said, you. That's the context of it. Woe unto you. Ah. That means the sins of the spirit will transmit a man to become a hypocrite. What's happening? This is why he's a hypocrite. He doesn't want to remove the beam. See what? It I funny. I lied. I cheated. I'm angry. I'm envious. Deliver me, oh God. That's why you miss someone. Say, see, envy is disturbing. You have been envious of this person. Can, can you join me in prayer that the envy will go? That means you are removing the beam. The moment you remove it, what happens is that the bad things that the beam is trying to hold will show up. It's like a house that is just crashing down. But a hip doesn't remove the beam. What he does is that he paints it. He called it you whited sepulchers. Read the whole chapter of Matthew 23. You'll see it. You wash the outside of the bottle, but the inside is rotten and is bad. But you don't want to fix it. So it's like a beam that is holding up evil. What sins of the spirit do is that they hold up a, another dimension of evil and then if you don't break them out, you become a hypocrite. My father and the Lord will say, if you lose the virtue of sincerity, you will become a fake. He didn't say if you make a mistake, you become a fake. He didn't say if you fall, you become a fake. The Bible says the righteous falls seven times. Seven means complete. He said, but he will rise up again. Do you know why he will rise up again? When he falls, he just tells God, I fell because of envy. I fell because forgiveness. I fell because of fear. No, 
no, not, not for today. I don't have time to explain. I'll have told you some things. But, but fear is, is, not, is something you should not have. I fear because of timidity. I fear because of timidity. When you open those things up, it's like a sepulchre. God will come and clean up the mess that those things are upholding. He cursed people for two reasons, Jesus. Woe unto you, hypocrites. And I say, woe unto you, fools. No, I just say you should not call a man a fool. But in this place, he say, woe unto you, fools. And who is a fool? A fool is he that has said in his heart that there is no God. That means his heart has come to a point that he has covered. He doesn't see God in it again. Can I take you back? When Cain killed Abel, God showed up and said, where is your brother, Abel? He said, am I my brother's keeper? And God cursed him. And when God cursed him, guess what? The Bible says he ran from God's presence because there's no God in his heart again. If you don't deal with the sins of the spirit, they will make you a hypocrite. Then they will make you a fool. A person without God in the heart. Do you remember Esau? Esau fell and he was cheated. He came to his father. His father said, no blessing. He said, bless me even if it's one more. The father said, in the day you... That means in God, Esau, if you keep pursuing God, God will break that yoke that is upon you. Instead of Esau to follow the pattern of God to break the yoke, he chose the pattern of leaving the beam in his life, that yoke. And instead of laboring to break the yoke, he said, I will not break the yoke. Let me fool. I love. Discernment and judgment is not God's way again. His discernment and judgment is without God. He's stopping us. Help us. We have seen you help sinners. They said, no, no. We are not going to use God's way. Let us set him up by ourselves. Let's not wait for God to deal with the matter. Let us set him up and bring him down. When you stay in the state of hypocrisy or when you leave that beam and you don't remove it, it will bring that's the sins of the spirit. If you leave the beam of the sins of the spirit, it will bring you to hypocrisy. When it brings you to hypocrisy, it makes you a fool. When it makes you a fool, the Bible says, woe. So your spiritual life just starts dying. No, it didn't die because you sinned. It died because you covered it up. No. Jesus never turns his heart, his help away from a broken heart and from a contrite spirit. He never does. So if you see a man that backslid and left God, it was not the sin you saw him commit that was the problem. There was a sin in the spirit that sustained the sin you saw. If he deals with that sin in the spirit, that thing that is trying to weigh him out of God will crash down. Biggest beams, pride. How can they hear that me? See what happened to his son. He kept acting peace, only waiting for his father to die. He had entered the state of hypocrisy. The Pharisees kept coming to listen to Jesus, to even ask him questions, to even come and say, We know you are a teacher. We know, we know. They were healing him. They even called him master. But guess what? It was only there was a beam underneath. They were waiting to trap him. Cain went on relating normal with Abel until he delayed him. Are you relating normal with someone you have been planning to bless him for? You should get this sign. You will know there is a sin of the spirit in you and you can deal with it quickly. Is there someone that if, they, if something bad happens to the person, you will feel good? You feel a little bit good about it. Is a sin in your spirit sustaining something? Is there someone that anytime he shares a testimony, something good happens around you? They say, sin in the 
spirit. There's an, an envy, an anger, an unforgiveness, a pride, a heart. There's something in your spirit, man. If you don't rejoice over good in the life of people, a person, the person that you broke up from, when you heard that he has not entered a relationship and you saw he was getting married, were you happy for him? If you were not, something is wrong in this. Psalm 19. Psalm 19, verse 12. Imenai kome ni kevana deili akobe nata. Sanctify my heart, O God. Purify me, O Lord. Imenai kobe peni. Aya. Psalm 19. Verse 12 to 14. Who can understand his errors? Cleanse thou me from secret for Permit me the sins of the spirit. They are false, but your neighbor bought a car. All of a sudden, you felt pain. Why should he buy a car before me? Now he will think that envy has been there. You didn't know he's buying car. Was God showing you mercy? So you will discover a secret fault. Have you seen when you are saying somewhere in your heart, we are just watching, we are just watching. When it open up, when she fail, when that thing scatter, they will know. Something is wrong with you. Stop looking at the moat. That, that's where we are coming to now. That's, that's the, the, the curve to this matter. You are, you are looking at. She, she is failing now. Uh-huh. That you are doing is a sign that there is a log. A big being. Holding up disaster. Let's leave people's moats. Leave the, the speck in them. And see the beam. Let me read verse 12 again. Who can understand his errors? If someone had told David that he can kill a man because he slept with a man's wife to cover it up, I don't think David would have agreed. David would say, I cannot cut the garment of Saul. It, it pierced my heart when I cut a man's clothes. It was his enemy's clothes he was cutting. His enemy. But he pricked his heart when the heart was still right. But something kept precipitating in his heart for a long time and he didn't know. It was lost. He was not aware. That thing started long. We don't have time to explain. It started long in his life. The same set up a man to die. That clothes, if he tears a garment, he feels bad. Now he can kill a man and sit down at home peaceful. And the only reason... Something is wrong. Is that a prophet came as man? That was this Christ. Say, who? I just discovered I can be bad. Ah, I don't stop having time to. You are, you are busy looking at people's errors. If you know what your heart can do, you will not. You will forget about people. Spend your time. Say, God, I don't know what I can do that is bad. Can you help me? You say, who can discover? Me. Keep back thy servant also, verse 13, from presumptuous sins. You are presuming somebody's life is bad. You don't know your own. You have not checked your own. Many times when you check your own, you won't be able to talk about other people's own. 
keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Do you remember what God told Cain? He said, sin is at your door. To have dominion. There is something that is a being. If you leave it, it will turn you to a monster, Cain. Say, don't let them. Let them not have dominion over me. Then, if you can remove those secret force, then shall I be upright. He didn't say righteous. Righteousness is a function of the acts or your state with God when it comes to salvation. Uprightness is a state of heart in his dealings with men. Then my heart will be upright. And guess this thing. I, excuse me. I shall be innocent from the great transgression what's the great transgression let the words of my mouth judgment declarations about a matter speaking about other people let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight the great transgression that one that brings God to a point to say I hated this all because when I the meditation art, he was planning how to kill Jacob. Because when I saw the meditations of your heart, it was about how to pull down your the prophets. When you read some Matthew chapter 20, you hear him say, Oh, ye that kill your prophets. I've seen the meditation of that. You didn't ask me a question, Pharisee, because you wanted to learn about God. You asked me because you wanted to kill me. And now to them, all the prophets you killed from righteous Abel to Berechah that died between the pots and the altar, all the blood will come upon you. The great transgression. What has your mouth been uttering and what has your heart been meditating? Ay, Anai, Omini Kava, Ameino Nevia. Look at what envy is turning you to. Just look at it. Look at what pride is doing to you. Look at what unforgiveness is turning you into. Look at what lust is turning you into. Now you are strategizing destruction. You can plan it. You are, that's, weak, that's called wickedness. Say the wicked, they, they, they cannot sleep and wake up. But when they lay down, they devise. That means they plan. I will tell this person. Then I will call this person and tell this person. They will not know. Say this person is, ah, how did you get? It's to plan. I don't mean you step on somebody by mistake. That's not wickedness. That's sin. Wickedness is when you now sit down and plan. Like Cain. Like Esau. Like the Pharisees. But you know who can do it. Mm. Cleanse thou me from secret faults. Don't let them have dominion over me. Innocent from the great transgression, cause my heart to be upright. But the words of my mouth. So when I judge a matter, when I look at my brother and say, There is something in your eye, it is bad. He said, And the meditations of my heart, the reason I'm doing it, he said, That God will say, Ah, I saw when you spoke to your brother about what he did wrong, I accept it, you did it right. Do you know Nathan came to tell David, You are the man, you have done evil? God liked that one. Do you know the prophets God sent to warn people? God liked it. Jesus warned the Pharisees. God liked it. But guess what? They were men God had to deal with first. He had to deal with the state of their heart. Can we make you cry this night and tell God? Cleanse me from secret fault. There's a beam somewhere. He has kept. He's storing up things until my life becomes a disaster. Search my heart. Mm. I, my own error. 
Cleanse me from sin. Restrain me from precious things. Restrain me. Restrain me. Don't let them have dominion over me. What has been knocking at your door, brother, sister? What is that sin that has been knocking at your door? Maybe God is repeating today and saying you can have dominion over it. When in the New Testament, if you are born again, the Bible says sin had no more dominion. But the Bible is teaching us that if we allow secret sins, it will make us become hypocrites. It will make us become fools and sin will have dominion over us. Our heart will not be a heart that there is no God. And that is not what God wants. God wants the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart to be acceptable to him. He wants my heart to be upright. He wants me to be innocent of the great transgression. Can you tell God, I don't understand my own errors. Cleanse down me from secret faults. And keep me back from presumptuous sins. That's the log. That's the beam in my own life. Sorry. Uh, oh God. Cleanse me. Such my heart, such my heart, oh Lord, cleanse my heart. Cleanse my heart. Pointing people's errors, God, search my heart. Cleanse me from secret. Cleanse me from the sins of the spirit. He take them away. Oh, take away anger. Take away fear. Anything by which Satan is trying to keep things in my life that is not righteous. You may be shocked that the addiction you are struggling with, lust, pornography, fornication, masturbation, stealing, it may just be that there is somebody you didn't forgive. There is somebody you envy. There is a pride somewhere. It doesn't look as if it's connected. Cleanse me, cleanse me. Yes, yes, yes. You need to forgive and let go. Let the garbage in your life be. We say when you open up the sepulchre, don't worry, let them mock you, but let your heart become upright. Your heart is more important. The psalmist says, if God will count in it, But there is one that can purge away our iniquity. Purge it away, O oh God. Mm. Because of time we are rounding up. But to everyone listening. Sit down on the man. And when he brings it up, believe him. 
He will tell you things to do. And let me tell you, most of the things he will tell you to do will humble you. Because it will be like a man opening up a sepulcher. A man opening, the, opening up a gallon that looks clean on the outside, but is dirty inside. And people will hear the smell and laugh, but God will wash you. God will cleanse you. And you will have an upright heart. From that point, the meditations of your heart and the utterances of your mouth will be acceptable to him. Maybe not to men, but they will be acceptable to him. Father, we thank you for another session. Don't leave us to our own errors. Search our hearts. Try our thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in us. When you find it, cleanse us from our secret faults. Deliver us from the dominion of those faults. And lead us in the way everlasting. Let our hearts become upright. Let us become innocent of the great transgression. And that from this point, Lord, and much more as we walk with you, the words of our mouth and the meditations of our heart will become acceptable in your sight. Thank you, our strength and our redeemer. In Jesus' precious name, we have prayed. Amen. God bless you. We'll see you next time. I I I I I I beckon me to come and call us to your deep.